Hey everybody, and welcome to this week's Design Cinema. This is episode 51. So I know we were supposed to work on the uh, insect silhouette, but uh, this video I've done uh, for Imagine Effects is now available to the public. Uh, this is actually a pre-recorded video I've done a few months ago for the special uh, magazine that uh, came out, which is the Star Wars special. Uh, you probably came out in November or October of last year, of 2011. Uh, you, it's no longer on the stands anymore, you probably have to um, special order it. But uh, in that magazine is a print version of this tutorial, and this was the supplementary video that came on the DVD uh, along with the Imagine Effects magazine. So this is a magazine that we subscribe to here at the school as well. It's a very good uh, art and design magazine, so if you haven't seen it or heard of it, go to your local store and you can probably find it on the shelves. Uh, great great publication, got lots of tutorials inside them, uh, in, including stuff like this, right? And they also always uh, generally come with a DVD that has videos of the tutorial as well. So the main difference between this one and the one you find in the magazine is that I'm doing the audio for this one, whereas the other one is blank. You just watch the video run uh, basically in fast forward. So, anyways, um, so I gotta thank Imagine FX for putting this article up a few months ago. It was quite nice uh, of them to do that. And uh, so, let's just jump into this video. So, the process I'm using is something I've done in the past before. Uh, if you haven't seen all my videos in the, in the uh, previous episodes, I recommend to look up the one that's called Fat Bug. I cannot remember which episode that is. I'm sure some of you would uh, could type it into the comments. But that one uses the same technique as this one. But the main focus of this tutorial for Imagine Effects wasn't about these, these two paintings. It was more about my workflow, about how I multitask on a project. Uh, for guys like myself who pretty much just freelance, I only had two full-time jobs in my entire career. Uh, all the other years are done completely in freelance. Um, we have to control our time management very, very well. So unlike a full-time position in which you are you know, working for the em uh, employer year after year, if you screw up on a few days uh, in a month or in a year or whatever, it's not really going to affect the company that much. You know, Say you weren't that productive for a week, and that happens all the time. Say you know, the week after E3 or you know, around Christmas time, whatever, you tend to goof off. You know, I remember those days in the game companies, you know, everyone plays games and stuff like that. And the employers that generally count uh, they account for that kind of stuff in production time because not all employees are 24 hours a day working. Um, but for freelance, we don't have that luxury because we are commissioned and paid per time. So if you're uh, on a project, say a video game for a week uh, to do some uh, concept art for it, you have to produce work that's worth a week's uh, of load, right? You can't be turning in a, a single sketch after a week and then expect the clients to pay you for a week of work. They're not going to do that. And in general, you kind of work out your uh, rates and the amount of stuff you produce ahead of time. So if you promise the clients, hey, in this week I'm going to do um, six paintings plus ten drawings, you got to produce that kind of stuff. And once you hang up the phone, and uh, your client's going to depend on, on you to turn that in on Friday. So as a freelance pr uh, individual, you have to then, throughout that week, manage your time extremely well. You know, can you get this done on time? Are you going to go goof off and hang out with your friends? Or are you going to stay home and get these paintings done first? So for me, one of the biggest um, techniques I use to control time is to multitask, which is to start all my drawings or paintings at the same time. Uh, this has a bunch of advantages, and I believe I've covered this in the past, but uh, if you haven't heard about it, I will mention it in this video since that is exactly what we're doing here. Um, so imagine I'm doing these two paintings. Now, if you're going to start one painting, say you have one day to do both of these paintings, right? If I start this painting, which you see here, and just start painting, I can actually get lost in it for hours and hours and hours without that much control. I can just keep going, keep going. And as the time flies by, you look at the clock, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, 2 a.m. in the morning and the, the other painting hasn't even got started and the whole thing is due at 9 a.m. And then you start panicking, you start doing a second painting and because you're nervous, you're panicking, the second painting starts to suffer and maybe you got nothing done until like 4 a.m. and then it's like you start painting and it's not so good and then by the time it's 9 a.m. you're kind of dead, the painting is not so good. The first one also kind of not finished, and you turn it in and you know you, ha you have to turn the stuff in but maybe it's not managed, the time was not managed well. So by working in dual parallel, it gives me the advantage of bringing both paintings to a semi-finish at the exact same time. So no matter at what stage I stop these paintings, both of them are done to a certain extent. And my goal here is to try to get to a presentable stage within an hour or two, you know, that quickly. So even though it's still rough, it is presentable. Now, maybe not what the clients are expecting at that time, but if they want this painting, and say like they call back in two hours and say, hey, do you got anything going yet? I go, yeah, actually I do. I have both paintings roughed out. Um, that is a great way to, you know, lock your clients in and also keep, get everyone on the same page. You can see here that I've also, um, I've started to work on a second painting. 
the first one I got to a you know it's not presentable yet but the overall color palette the design everything is roughed in so I'm happy with it uh, I know that I could get it done in time so now I switch to the second one and this one is the same process we start with a line drawing a fairly loose line drawing but the fundamentals are done correctly and then laid in some textures from various photos and then use those colors to then uh, do the painting with it um, again getting it knocked out to about the same finish level as the first painting and then we'll go back to the first one work that on that one for another 20 or, uh, minutes or a half an hour and then come back to this one back and forth back and forth so in about two hours or so which will be a total of uh, four hours two hours each uh, both paintings will be in a quite good condition so the total time for these took about eight hours. I think I spent about four hours each, so about a good day to get two of these done. And that's pretty average for a uh, freelance uh, person to do. Uh, you could actually do more depending on what the uh, finish level you want or what the client wants. Now, don't compete yourself against uh, what I'm doing here. Everybody works on different pace. Everyone has their own schedule. Everybody has their own rates. Uh, but you know, once you work in this in industry for a, a while, uh, the clients are expecting a certain amount of output from you, right? You can't be someone that's in the industry for 10 years and then tell the client, you can only do one painting a week you know that's 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 not professional so but anyways uh, this is pretty average for me you know two three paintings a week uh, a day is not a, that much of a deal um, so especially something of this kind of quality so right now I'm just blocking in all the values um, so going back to the time management thing because some of you guys I think I know our students time management is a major major issue for younger students you know same with our school here uh, a lot of young kids are just very bad at managing time because they uh, procrastinate you know I do as well when I was uh, younger in school and stuff you always think uh, I know I could go out with my friends hang out and I'll go back and do this work and then you find out you get back you're tired and whatever some kind of reason you can make up your mind that makes you not do the work to 100% so throughout my career I I've started to get really, really good and manage my schedule. Um, I say maybe in about 2003, 2004, I was in that kind of hardcore freelance mode and I really had to bunker down and get very, very serious with time management because when you screw up on timelines, screw up on time management, you got your injured careers because again, we're freelance artists and you cannot call up the clients on, on Friday and tell them you didn't do anything the whole week or you're late or you can't deliver something until Monday. Very unprofessional not what they expect especially if you're working with giant clients uh, out there like the publishers like EA or you know War Bay Films or DreamWorks or Warner Brothers and these kind of major publishing companies because they're used to working with professionals and they expect a certain level of behavior from professionals so for students to succeed in this business you have to be good with time management and you can never procrastinate and never put the clients second right they don't care about lies you can say hey man you know my I got in the car accident they don't care because this is a business we are not doing a bunch of artwork here for the clients to go yeah that's really pretty they need this kind of design to go on to the next stage so multitasking allows me to do that and I've been using this technique for as long as school actually I learned this when I was in our center um, and we do the same thing here we teach our students and hopefully they're doing it I have no idea if they are or not but we definitely try to teach our students to work on multiple drawings, paintings, or designs all at the same time. And so the first advantage, of course, is the time management, right? It gets everything done on time. You kind of have a good control on everything. And another one is confidence. As you start getting one done, you feel good about it. Like this painting here that I've gone back to, I know even though it looks messy to you guys, in my head, I know what's going on. I know I could get this done. So your confidence level gets boosted. And I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. When you start sketching something and it starts to look good, you feel good about it and the drawing almost finishes itself. Versus you start drawing and it just doesn't work. You keep struggling, you keep struggling. And the more you do that, the more stress you get. Your, your palms start getting sweaty and all that kind of stuff, right? So because our industry really, a lot of has to do with mental. You know, you have to control that mental state of yours. And having confidence is a big, big part of it. You know, the more confident you are, the more relaxed you are, the faster things go, the more relaxed something goes. And the more lively or loose your painting looks or drawing, right? The more tense you are, the more stiff your drawings will become. So by working in this kind of dual process, it allows me to kind of at this stage feel very confident and using that energy, you know, almost like a basketball player when they say, you know, someone's on fire or something, you turn immediately to this painting, like the one right here, you see here. So we get that same energy going. This painting is you know, about half an hour behind than the other one, right? It's not as uh, starting to get refined. But because you're in that mode, you're in that kind of confident zone, I could go to this one and start working. The other way of working in which you take a whole painting and bring it to a complete finish, one of the mo most dangerous thing I see for that one is that, you know, you have all the confidence, you have that, and you devote it all into that one painting. By the time you're done with it, you might be four or five hours into it, you are very, very drained because you have used up all that energy finishing that one painting. 
And if you're on a tight deadline, the second painting will suffer because you're you're simply running out of energy. You know, you, you only have so much calories a day, uh, a day to burn on this kind of stuff. So I try to distribute all that energy evenly and distribute especially in the beginning. The beginning phases of a painting or a drawing or any design is the most, most important, at least for me. Because I find that's when all the stuff comes together. The fundamentals, the designs, the shapes, the lighting, the colors, the mood, all that kind of stuff comes in the first maybe one hour of your painting. So once that stuff is done, the rest, the detail and everything is much, much easier to do. And even if I'm tired, I can actually do those kind of stuff by turning off your brain. You know, I could think about other things when I'm doing the detail part, which I'll get to in this video in about uh, maybe five, ten minutes or so. So right now, this is the most critical stage this is when your brain cell is probably burning a lot of calories uh, getting your mind to get figure things out figuring out the hard stuff you know where's the reflected light where's the bounce light where, where am I putting the mood where is the uh, you know the, the energy where's the focal point those things your brain must think to resolve because you don't if you don't resolve that the painting doesn't come together so at this point the stress level is still quite high but at least I got both paintings knocked in and I know how far I could carry them so the stress level has been reduced right the most stressful part is that the initial white page I stare at right I think most of you guys could uh, relate to that you have nothing in front of you and you have a deadline that's uh, the next day and your clients are expecting something great from you right um, especially you know they hang up the phone call they're like Man, we can't wait to see it tomorrow, man. We, you know, we're not going to be impressed or something. You know, they're doing that to put pressure on you. They're doing that, you know, they say that because they know that, hey, look, give us something good. Don't give us something crappy, you know. And uh, as a pro, you got to pull that off. And that is uh, some serious stress, um, especially if you guys um, do freelance uh, like myself. So anyways, let's talk about technique. These paintings were, I actually did this at home, which is a very powerful PC that can handle very high resolutions. So both of these um, what you call it, paintings are actually in the same PSD file. They're not separate uh, images. Um, now, if you have a weaker computer, you probably don't want to do that because the resolution of these paintings are 10,000 pixels wide. And I have two of these. Now, I don't use too many layers. The only layers you have is the line layer and the painting. That's it. So each painting is two layers only. But because I have two of them, they have a lot of colors, and that 10,000 pixels Photoshop file gets pretty big. And it gets pretty slow if you don't have a lot of RAM. Um, so I recommend you divide them into two different canvases or two different PSD files. Um, but in this case, it's OK. My computer can handle it. So um, yeah, 10,000 wide. I don't know the height, uh, whatever. This is a 235 film ratio painting. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the math. Oh, I guess it's 2,350, uh, uh, whatever the, the height is, right? So because 235 uh, ratio, no, that's not right because it's two, uh, it's one to 2.35. So whatever that math equals to. So right now I'm too busy to, to work that out for a 10,000 wide uh, image. So anyways, um, starting snow to paint. At this point, I'm still keeping the line drawing around uh, because I need to see my design. So this one, I had a certain you know, sometimes I start my paintings without a single line drawing at all, just to spontaneously generate values and generate designs. But for this, I kind of wanted to um, continue a series of designs I've started while I was teaching in school with, uh, with some of our students, uh, which is a world based on insects. Uh, as you guys probably know, I like bugs a lot. So in this world, uh, I want everything to be different. I want, you know, even though you see a city, you see vehicles, I want their technology, their, the way they design stuff to be very, very different than what we have here on Earth. So this is like um, a design of a taxi or something like that. And in order to pull that off, I sometimes required at least a, a pass of line drawing because I need to work out design. So because this is a very close-up object uh, to spontaneously generate this, uh, maybe I could do it, but maybe I could struggle. I don't know. But since I'm recording this for Imagine Effects, I couldn't uh, record a bunch of struggling drawings. That wouldn't be good uh, for the viewers. So a previously done line drawing helps with that. And the drawing doesn't take too long. It's about maybe uh, 15, 20 minutes sketch or something. Because the drawing does is not part of the final. So I don't need to make the drawing very, very tight. Just enough to give me the design and hold all the major forms. Once I have that, I could then paint the rest. So you can see that I'm starting to um, turn off the line drawing as I work. Um, at a certain point, I'll delete that layer when it's no longer needed. So if you step back from the screen and uh, blur your eyes, you can see that the major forms are starting to read. You see that there's a big uh, kind of uh, giant vehicle right here. There's a crowd in front of that. There are some buildings behind it. The story here is kind of like a um, kind of like a club scene, um, like you get a Hollywood Boulevard or something like that, like some celebrity is getting out of this limousine taxi vehicle or something like that and going to the um, bar which is on the upper um, left right now of the screen and the big giant glass domes or people drinking and partying inside just very noisy very busy and uh, because the celebrity is getting out all the crowds kind of getting excited they're all kind of looking you know like paparazzi or something like that just fans and stuff so kind of that nightclub scene that night feeling and uh, 
I actually planned the two to work together as well. This one and the uh, other scenery. This is a kind of a nighttime scene. The other one's a daytime scene. This one is a very entertainment type of uh, kind of luxury world. The other one is a battlefront. The final composition of this painting will face from uh, the front of the ship will be going from um, left to right, whereas the other one goes from right to left. So that way when we stack these two paintings, one on top of the other, they complement each other. Um, this one deals with a primarily greenish warm tone. The other one deals with a coolish yellow tone. So these are actually designed to work with each other. Uh, another kind of uh, advantage of working uh, in dual uh, sequences or multitasking. So. Sometimes I, on projects I work on a lot more than just two, sometimes uh, maybe three to five paintings all at once. And maybe you've seen that in uh, some previous episodes I've done in which we have about three paintings or four paintings open all at the same time. So it just gives it um, you know, a nice way to control your paintings, get the designs fresh, which reminds me of another advantage of doing this. You know, it, it keeps your um, designs fresh because you, for me, I get bored of these kind of things pretty quickly. You know, two, three hours into a painting, you're kind of, your mind's already used to the painting. The only thing you're doing is kind of labor work, you know, which is adding the details in. Uh, at that point, the fun factor is not really there anymore. The fun pack fa uh, factor for me is always the first uh, hour or so. And then it just becomes work, you know, it's like straight up work. Oh, so, sorry about that. This is a skip. I didn't record all the labor intensive stuff like I was just talking about. This skipped to about, I skipped about three hours here actually. So you've seen this painting becoming uh, quite uh, refined at this point. But anyways, going back to the mundane stuff. By having two, three paintings open at once or drawings, you could go back and forth. When you get bored of one, go back to the other. When you get bored of the other one, come back to this one. And another thing is it lets you spot mistakes. Right? When you work with the same painting all the time, you might have a very obvious mistake that you just don't see because your mind is kind of you know burned in. You're not you're not focusing on it. Um, by switching back and forth, you notice that. So again, I think I mentioned this many times in the previous videos. Uh, but if you guys are new to design cinema, this is a kind of a refresher uh, episode, I guess, uh, since the topic is not really something new. Um, so going back to this painting, so at this point I flipped the uh, cam uh, canvas back again. I work in uh, back and forth all the time. So at this stage, it's about again three hours in real time that I have not recorded because I just wanted to paint details. And you can see that it got quite refined. The line drawing is gone. The main selling point of this painting, which is the um, kind of uh, limousine crazy bug ship, whatever it is, uh, the celebrity right there is getting out. It's kind of like doing the, yeah, 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 I'm here. You know, it's got like five arms or something like that. And then you can see the, like a little fanboy right in front of him going, oh my God, you know, the, the guy is here or whatever. Uh, the driver is sitting inside the ball thing. You can see there on the right of the vehicle, uh, which I thought was kind of cool, cool design. It's kind of like an eyeball almost. You can see it moving almost like an eye. It's kind of shifting. So if I was working with an animator, I'll probably do a couple of sequence and also provide him with some reference images to show him how to animate uh, this vehicle. So one of them will be the eye, the, the cockpit area. It will turn like a like a crow's eyeball, very mechanical and very precise. And then all the stuff that's on the body, all of them are shivering. It's almost like a mechanical snake. So all the shells are kind of going in and out like a living machine. So everything's going, you know, making that kind of crickety but metallic sound. And everything's moving. So that's kind of the design behind this thing, that this vehicle itself feels like a very, very complex insect. So I mean, those are, that's our job, right? Our job is to create new things from existing things. You know, this is definitely a a design based off insects, but uh, you know, how do you take that design to a new world or a new look is up to you, and that's our job. So and that's what clients pay you for. So that one's pretty much done. So let's go back to uh, to this one. So this one, I haven't worked on it for quite a while. I brought that almost to a complete finish. Um, but actually, this is a overlap video. It's actually uh, worked on the same time, but not recorded uh, at the same time. So this is going back to another video that's overlapped and composite together. Um, so here we are with that other painting, and we're going to bring it to about the same finish. Uh, let me see if there's anything I left out in terms of technical stuff. Um, let's see. Not really. Yeah, just 10,000 pixels, two layers, paint. Um, and just same brush, my chalk brush, which is default. You, got, you guys are asking which brush I use. Uh, it's the chalk brush, uh, defaulted, except the opacity is turned off. Uh, this is CS5, which allows me to rotate the screen, which is something I'm not quite used to. Um, I don't rotate the screen too much at all. So CS5, uh, maybe in CS4, I think introduced the, um, the direct X uh, thing, which allows you to kind of rotate the screen. But I use it very, very rarely. I, I always forget that it's actually there. Uh, because I'm kind of very used to just working without it. Uh, so I've trained my wrist and arms to kind of just go around to find the uh, weird angles without relying on it. But it's pretty cool. Just press the R button and you can rotate your canvas. So um, this painting came together much faster than the other one. Um, the reason for it, because I think uh, it's kind of like a pretty loose 
um, environment here. This is these guys are going very very quick across the uh, the sand, right? These guys are kicking up dust, so the background could actually almost don't have to require as much detail as the nightclub scene, which had to paint other cars, people, buildings, architecture, club windows, all that kind of stuff. This one's just a two battleships or two uh, I don't know what we call these attack cruisers or something like that, uh, with their giant mothership above them, right? So. This design is kind of based on the hind or something, you know, where they have the dual cockpit, in which you have the gunner uh, in the front and your navigator slash pilot in the back. Um, the dual pilot thing, you know, the hind and the what, what else has this kind of stuff. So you know, a couple of Russian helicopters have this kind of uh, cockpit arrangement. Actually, the Apache has this kind of stuff as well, in which you have gunner and uh, pilot in this seating arrangement. So again, borrowing from the real world, but bringing it into a different alien um, kind of environment, but your viewers will resonate with the design. They'll understand it. You don't have to explain, right? Uh, our industry, the entertainment industry, as far as design goes, you have to be very self-explanatory. You know, the, the, the movie or the video game cannot pause, and then you cannot come on the screen and go, yeah, in this design, this is this, and this is that. You, you, there's no such thing. The design has to sell itself. And, uh, and you guys play a lot of video games, especially. You already know what the thing does just by looking at it, right? And that's probably a pretty good design, if that's the case. So... This painting here, again, going back and just detailing, detailing, detailing. This point, this is where it gets kind of mundane. The painting is pretty much done. If you blur your eye at this point, just blur it so it's very, very, kind of like you drank too much beer or something like that, nice and fuzzy. You can tell that the painting looks kind of finished, right? The, the uh, vehicle is reading. You can see the smoke is going across the land. But for your clear vision, again, it's kind of too loose, too scratchy, uh, not enough to present yet. Um, so basically what I'm doing is just clean it up, you know, removing the beer goggles and make sure the clients got to see it clearly. And that work is actually not that difficult to do, uh, especially if you've been doing this for a long time. The, the hard part is long done already. The first hour, it's long done. So this is when you could just kind of listen to music and uh, chat with your buddies and whatever. At least for me, uh, it's not that stressful at this point. So, and when I, for example, when I used to work at Skywalker Ranch on the Star Wars stuff, the pressure over there is very, very high. You're expected to do, for me, maybe 15 drawings, 15, 20 drawings a week, every single week, nonstop for a year and a half. So you're talking about some major output over there. And uh, I was working with a buddy of mine named Ryan, uh, who paints about seven or eight paintings a week. So the, the peer pressure alone is gigantic. I mean, you know, if he's doing paintings, you got to do more than him in terms of drawing, right? And then we've got some other guys in the art department like Eric and um, Warren and all these guys. And where everybody is super pro and everyone could produce mass amounts of work. So you're dealing with a lot of pressure. Not only, you know, on Mondays, are you, you know, you have to draw and design new stuff for the film. You're also competing with your with your um, work co uh, co-workers. You know what I'm saying? Everyone's competing. So you cannot simply show up on Friday with a meeting with George and then, you know, Ryan's got seven paintings on the wall and then you put up a sim simple little sketch. George will be like, what? What is this? You know what I'm saying? Why are you here? So every gotta, everybody has got to produce. So this kind of mass production stuff work uh, extremely well there because on Mondays and Tuesdays over there, uh, it's high stress. Uh, most of us are not really talking. It's very quiet. Art department, everyone's got their um, headphones on. And at the time, the uh, iPod just came out, you know, the big, large, fat iPod. You guys probably still remember that one. So, you know, it's very quiet. No one's really talking. We don't goof off much because everyone's doing the same thing. We're all starting pretty much the entire week's worth of work on Monday. So everyone's doing comps, everyone's doing multiple multiple uh, images just like what I'm doing here. Uh, so for me, I try to get all 10 or 15 comps done on the first day on Monday. Uh, then coming Tuesday, start doing the, some of the uh, planning, the hardcore. For me, I was doing most of the environments and joints, uh, man-made stuff. So I had to go in and actually plot out some of the perspective. And back then it was all done on paper. There was no Photoshop. So I had to bust out the ruler and plot everything all perfect and everything. But by Wednesday, it gets pretty, you know, at least the stress level starts to go down because everyone is just finishing the stuff and the details. And that's when the art department gets pretty noisy. We start talking, playing trivia games, uh, blasting music and all that kind of stuff. And that's pretty much the same in most art departments, right? Most professionals work in this kind of uh, uh, routine, I guess, right? Production thinking versus uh, more of a gallery or art way of thinking, right? In which you pay for a single piece or something like that. You could take much as your time as you want because you're getting paid per piece. We get paid for time, right? And for a client, they want many designs as possible in the shortest amount of time, uh, you know, that you could do. So for us, it's all about mass production. So the more uh, refined your pipeline is, the more successful most likely you'll be. Uh, of course, at the end of the day, the most important thing is cool designs. That is not part of this formula. That's part of your training and your background. So 
Um, anyways, this painting, this is a pretty fun painting to do. Actually, I still remember doing this one, even though it's about three, four months ago, uh, because I like the designs of these guys. They feel, again, it's kind of like that ro robot machine. If this was animated, all those little things are breathing, all the panels are clinking, so you can hear the metallic, uh, the chink, like, ch -ch -ch -ch, you know, like crickets or something like that, but all metallic. Uh, going across the sand, maybe some cool sound effect by Ben Burt or something like that, you know, from Star Wars or something. So. This the issue of Star Wars special, but I didn't want to draw something from Star Wars, you know, just to um, same similar theme, but let's just change it design slightly so this could be applied to anything, right? So, but it's kind of like you know, got the pot racer, uh, pot racer kind of thing going on with the low to the ground, a lot of lot of dust get kicked up and stuff like that, um, but with military bug designs. So now the line drawing you can see I'm still keeping around because I didn't work on the mothership that much at this point, so I need the line drawing to uh, work on that point. So the mothership is quite far away. It's above these guys. Um, maybe maybe it drops off these little fighters or something, or maybe the fighters are escorting. Who knows? Um, for some of these paintings, I like the viewer to make up their own mind as far as what the heck is going on in the uh, painting. So um, at this point, just detailing, working it out. Not much other thing going on, right? Listen to music, relax. So let's, let's see if we can cover some other questions I've seen in the channels. Uh, most of you guys are still asking for brush and color palettes and all those kind of things. My biggest advice is don't worry about it. Just work with the default stuff. And I mentioned that many, many times because all this kind of stuff is just tools. And the more you have underneath you, actually the more confusing it gets. The best way to learn all of this kind of stuff, keep it simple. Uh, default Photoshop round brush, boom, you got it. Uh, color palette, I mean, I used to just paint with the default RGB that it comes with in Photoshop and just mix it around with the um, HSB slider. And that's it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and just start painting, start drawing. That's what's going to make you better. Now, none of these tools will make you any better. You know, you can have the coolest brush in the world, but if you don't know the fundamentals or how to draw well or how to paint well or understand how light works in certain conditions, it's not going to do a single thing. Tools, computers, they're all, they, they have no brain. They're, they're IQ-less, you know what I'm saying? It all, the procession, I mean, the creativity comes from you. So a brush or even what software you use is completely irrelevant. A professional could do this kind of stuff in Photoshop and they could also do it on gouache uh, with oil on canvas because the, the fundamentals does not change. So, I mean, I used to do this kind of stuff in gouache, you know, a long time ago in, in traditional painting. Uh, and the technique is exactly the same, the same way of approach uh, because it's the same. The fundamentals does not change. So only the tool has. So don't, too, don't worry too much, you know. And... Um, Best way to practice is to do a lot of this kind of stuff. Last week we mentioned that for the bug stuff, in which uh, most of our students are spending something like around 12 to 16 hours a day doing this for an entire year straight. Um, that's the level of commitment you must do in order to get good. Because think about it, um, you know, you can work at your own leisure, that's fine. You could do one painting a week, that's fine. You know what I'm saying? However, if you want to break into this industry, at the same time you're doing that, there are a lot of guys out there who are doing 16 hours a day, meaning they are 16 times more efficient or more learning more than you. So in one year, they're maybe 10 years ahead of you. You know, the gap is tremendous. Uh, some of our students who even within a year probably is about five to six years ahead of their peers who are not doing this, uh, you know, on a, on a pressure basis. So by the time they get out, it's not like, oh, they're one year ahead of you. No, they're five, six years ahead of you. And if they get a job, they jump even faster because you learn a lot of stuff on the job. So these students who get out after a year, they start, you know, working professional in the field compared to their friends who are still probably learning their own, goofing around, whatever. Uh, the most likelihood of their friends making it, it becomes almost zero because that gap becomes such a huge thing that it's unreachable, right? You have to cross that line of professionalism and that line takes many, many hours to achieve. So, you know, dueling at home, drawing here and there, goofing off, hanging out with your friends, playing video games, all that kind of stuff, all that kind of stuff will hurt your career. So my advice is to focus on this kind of stuff 100% until you're in. Once you're in, then yeah, go ahead, play all the video games you want. You'll get sick of it because the, your clients will make you play games, you know what I'm saying? So when I was uh, through my freelance days, they, they sent you so many Xboxes and Playstations and stuff, you don't know what to do with them because all the clients have to, you have to play their games before it comes out. And uh, so they have to send the betas to you, they send all the line of games. So if you're working for EA, they'll be like, you know, here's our games for the last year or whatever. You, you have so many video games, you have no worries, you know, same with the movies and stuff like that. So, you know, don't worry about that kind of stuff. It all comes with the uh, being a professional. Right, so you got to put the commitment. And for me, I, I put in some serious hours in my school days. You know, no sleep for days and days and days for entire two and a half years. You know, it's just torture. 
you know, but it pays off in the end. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this. This video is, again, is not really about these two paintings that much. It's more about just the technique behind it and share you guys with some uh, industry uh, knowledge and things like that. But next week, we'll continue with the bug stuff. We'll bring that to color. So as this come to a close, again, if you guys got questions and stuff, uh, feel free to ask in YouTube. Now, I can't get to all of them all at the same time because I'm extremely busy. But if I see a good question or something that hasn't been answered, I'll try to get to them. But, you know, for you guys who, you know, ask questions, make sure you check all the other um, episodes as well because uh, the same question generally gets asked all the time like which Wacom tablet I use you know those things like that gets asked every single episode so just click around in the other ones uh, the ones that has a lot of views or something you'll probably find the same uh, answer in those as well so okay so I hope you enjoyed this video and, uh, and I'll see you guys next week and I'll use the, this time to also you can uh, turn on these layers so you can see um, the steps that it took to finish these two paintings so okay so thanks for watching and I will see you guys uh, next week bye bye